that I think will be helpful is to, when we're talking about an alternative farming system, is to recognize that farmers uh, react to conventional agriculture and the downsides of conventional agriculture. And while it is very productive and it has um, resulted in a really, you know, bountiful food system, there are some unintended consequences. So you have the watershed of the United States that drains into the Gulf of uh, Mexico uh, with all the nitrates, phosphorus, uh, feedlot, runoff, et cetera, and it causes hypoxia or a dead zone. And this is common around the world. You have pesticides and plastics and, and chemicals in, in, you know, from the agriculture industry, et cetera, that cause endocrine disruption in both males and females. And then with our modern GMO technology package with uh, Roundup Ready seeds and, and over-the-top herbicides on mega millions of acres, there's a huge disruption to the population to, of monarch butterflies and to soil biology. And so this is common, and this, is, this has been this way for decades. It's, and every generation has a new uh, issue, and this, these are the modern issues, but these, these sort of things have always been around. The second thing is, is that farmers and gardeners who are holistic minded really react to the health of the soil. And you'll see this um, is, is almost a universal observation that farmers and gardeners have had all over the world over all generations is where local biomass resources, weeds, leaves, cow manure, et cetera, are mixed together either accidentally or intentionally, and they go through a decomposition process, and then they further go through a transformation process. So that is the breakdown and buildup into humus. And humus, when it's added to this impoverished soil, it really enlivens the soil. It brings soil biology and, and gives a darker color to the soil and fertility. It has better tilth, it's easier to work. And this is a very visceral uh, feeling that farmers have for improving the soil and working with organic matter and soil life. And then when you get into these situations where you see a, a really substantial difference in the soil organic matter, like 1% versus 5% is a huge difference in its ability to function. And it has, um, you know, on the right side, you're gonna have more compacted soils, lower fertility, it's gonna be harder to work. It's gonna break into clods. And then when you have a better quality humus, you have this dark color and more, more uh, life in the soil, easy, uh, better tilth, easier to work, has better nutrient cycling. And there's even uh, something that came out of the biodynamic experience called the humus law. And that's something that Alex Podolinsky in Australia came up with. And the humus law says that you really need a three to 5% organic matter for the soil to properly function. In, in a natural way, so that you have natural fertility, natural insect and disease suppression, and so forth. So that brings me to this slide of the uh, a series of alternative farming systems that have been around over decades and are still emerging. Uh, but um, a lot of people are familiar with sustainable. That's one became very popular in the 1990s. USDA got on board. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of grant money became available to universities. It's really been a huge, huge movement. Organic includes organic agriculture in general, but also, of course, now it's more codified in the USDA, USDA program, the National Organic Program. Permaculture started in the mid to late 1970s uh, about ecological design, huge impact all over the world. And then you have nature farming in Japan, nature farming in Korea and in India. And all of those are around different microbial preparations like EM, effective microorganisms, the IMO or indigenous microorganisms. And then in, in India, they've had these recipes that go back thousands of years using cow dung and ghee and cow urine and, and leaves and biomass and ashes to make these recipes. And all of these can be used to promote fertility and pest control on the farm by using local biomass resources and microbial cultures to generate these beneficial biofertilizers. Uh, holistic grazing is big, biodynamic agriculture is big, and then finally we get down to eco-agriculture, and that's going to be the focus of today. So that, that's a huge, uh, been a huge influence, and what a lot of people don't realize is that there are mega millions of more acres that are managed under eco-agriculture, far and away above certified organic. And so that's what we're going to, we're going to review that today. 
But if you look at these, these all these different alternative farming systems, they all have some common themes. And one of them, really big, is non-toxic pest control. That's always been uh, what uh, most alternative farming uh, systems react to is the, you know, trying to reduce toxic chemistry. And by doing that, they aim for uh, mimicking nature to develop agroecosystems and big emphasis on organic and biological soil amendments. And all of those promote a healthy consortia of beneficial microorganisms. So we're gonna talk about Acres USA. And it's interesting, I was putting this together and, and just realized how significant the timing is because the uh, magazine itself was started in June, 1971. So this summer, it will be 50 years, which is amazing. And then the EcoAg conference and trade show, this just this last December was 45th annual. So uh, th this magazine has been around a long time and it's been very influential on many generations of farmers and consultants and so forth. So uh, actually I do have the bound volumes there of the desk reference. And I actually looked this up. This is the first issue of Acres USA Magazine, June 1971. And look at some of the topics that were in there. They were talking about chicken cancer or avian leukosis and the consequence of monoculture farming and gen genetic inbreeding, CAFO buildings with no access to grass and sunlight, salty diets laced with medications. Uh, as one housewife put it to Acres, chicken is good eating, but chicken these days isn't fit to eat. So there's a little bit of uh, twangy populism mixed in there. Uh, there was uh, studies suppressed on dangers of herbicides. At that time, it was 2,4,5-T. There, uh, there was an article about how the state regulators in Iowa and other places were banning um, soil conditioners. There was an article on organic food and ecology that referenced uh, the European pioneer, Sir Albert Howard, Fred Sykes. And then actually there was, these are the earliest guidelines that I've ever seen that detail what an organic food production system is. Uh, so that was in there, I had feed this, feeding the soil. And very interesting, look at this. The living soil with colloidal, colloidal properties that govern release of food to plants. Uh, I guess that's a, <laughs> I gotta get the misspelling in there food to plants. So the nutri nutritional aspects of soil fertility depend on the activities of living organisms and on the electrical properties of its non-living colloidal components. It's amazing. So all of that really sums up everything we know about a really good soil is that it has both living, thriving soil food web, and it has colloidal cation exchange capacity from the clay humus uh, properties that is at the really tiny level. They talked about all the, uh, the organisms that live in the soil, a million protozoas, algae, fungi, and bacteria in, in just a gram of soil. And then it had, they had the interviews. This, this, at that time, they were interviewing Bill Graves. And, they, and even in the early 1970s, they, people were selling organic feed and natural fertilizers, and then and so forth. So just to give you a perspective. So some things have changed, but other things have not really changed. There, we have a more or less similar things that we're dealing with today. So I thought that was really interesting. Now, the, in 1984, I was out of graduate school. I got a job as the uh, county extension horticulture agent, agriculture agent in Muskogee, Oklahoma. And uh, in 1985, I went to the first Acres USA. I should mention that by the, the mid-1970s, there was a natural food store or co-op in every college town in the country selling organic food. So, uh, you know, people were exposed to this back then. And so by 1985, I was already familiar with some of this. I went to the Acres USA conference and there was a booth there of a, a, a microbial inoculant company, Agri Serum that every year they would display this image of these corn roots and the corn cobs that are sealed in a curl jar. And it was about Ralph and Rita Ingleken who ran a really large organic farm in Iowa. And what they did was they dug up the corn roots from their organic farm that's biologically managed. And they would compare those with corn root stalks from neighboring farms that are really just doing monoculture, NPK, agriculture, spraying herbicides and pesticides, and look at the, look at the health of these plants. And then a really another, another 
common observation of healthy grown so food from, from nourished soils is that food will dry down instead of rot. And that's what you're seeing here with these cur jars. So, so you, there's a lot there, but basically it's the integration of mineral balance because they were using limestone, rock phosphate, organic fertilizers, and they were doing a lot of humus farming practices. They were using the, they were doing making compost. They were using the Pfeiffer compost uh, starter and they were, they were really specific about using the chisel pile instead of the moldboard plow, et cetera. So this is a good, um, I, I thought this was a, something that I saw that really spoke to me about the difference that's going on in agriculture. And I really wanted to pursue what is happening here? What really is going on behind the scenes? How does it work? And that has driven me all these years. So I was given a talk and a farmer actually suggested that I, I include this in that the acres theme really is about uh, both the pioneers and a whole series of teachers. So, and that's people refer to this as standing on the shoulder of giants. So pioneers like Weston A. Price, Andrew Voisson, William Albrecht, Kerry Reams, Maynard Murray, Bargila Rativer, Phil Callahan, Elaine Ingham, Don Huber. These were these are real trend-setting people who have really brought a whole set of knowledge base. Uh, to us. So, for example, Elaine talking about the soil fluid web in, in the 1990s, and Phil Callahan talking about paramagnetism, and Maynard Murray on sea minerals, William Albrecht and Kerry Reams on really rich uh, fertilization schemes for mineral balance and nutrition and nutrient dense foods. And then a whole series of teachers from Charles Walters, uh, F.A. Finzel, he was early on. And Gary Zimmer, Neil, Neil Kinsey, Arden Anderson, Bruce Tynio, Dan Scow, Phil Wheeler, et cetera. And you'll see Dan Kittress is down there at the bottom. And so it just continues on. And, and yeah, we're all learning from each other and we're all progressing and, and improving on the system. So then I think it's helpful to, I think if you, if you look through the history of eco-agriculture, you can really boil it down to what I refer to these as tenets. And these are the, the notions or the tenets of eco-agriculture that people um, use as a, as a guidepost and then try to improve on. And number one is mineral depletion of soils and then nutrient depletion of, of foods. So, uh, through the use and reliance of MPK fertilizers and, and no longer a, a big emphasis on animal manures, then over time, there's been a loss of trace elements in the soil. And um, so they're depleted. And we, there's papers on that, that show all this, how the minerals in food have been, been depleted over several decades of time. And then that ties into how can you grow nutrient dense foods and understanding that food can serve as a medicine. Then crop vitality and pest control, the concept that insects are nature's scavengers and a more of a metabolic approach to pest control than applied chemistry to pest control. How can you make the plants healthier and stronger by using both soil, soil applied uh, for, um, minerals and foliar fertilization? Now what's Different and interesting about eco farming is that it's it, it incorporates organic farming and it's and organic farming is very popular in eco agriculture, but it is not codified. It is not as strict. It, there's no set of standards for eco agriculture. But what you'll find is that there um, the different consultants and farmers will use selected chemical fertilizers like ammonium sulfate monoammonium sulfate, um, single superphosphate. These are pretty low uh, impact on the environment types of chemicals. And then they will, they will totally avoid others like uh, anhydrous ammonia. They'll avoid potassium chloride and glyphosate and so forth. And, and there's a reason for all that. So, you know, anhydrous ammonia, potassium chloride are both known to make the soil more compact and dense. And then finally, monitoring, measuring, and then modifying. And so, for example, Dr. Reams used to say, why well, guess when you can measure? And so um, eco farming consultants use penetrometers, refractometers, to measure the pH, electrical conductivity, 
oxidation reduction meter and and other instruments. So in terms of non-toxic pest control, there's kind of an ecological approach. And um, Everett Dietrich had the five features of IPM about developing uh, insect habitat strips to attract beneficial insects. Big emphasis on what I call the metabolic approach, and that is um, doing a biological terrain assessment of the plant sap and or the uh, petiole sap, et cetera, with BRICS meter, electrical conductivity meter, pH, uh, et cetera. Um, and then integrated minerals and biology from everything from the soil food web with its compost teas and extracts, on farm bio inoculants that you can brew, foliar fertilization with chelated trace elements, really sophisticated blends there. Uh, foliar fertilization with different kinds of biofertilizers and microbial inoculants you can brew on the farm or purchase. And then A to Z products, humic acid, granular humates, chelated trace elements, amino acid based trace elements, a whole toolbox of commercial biopesticides and microbial inoculants, natural and organic soft pesticides. And then, I mean, it is real farming and people are raising pretty substantial acreage of fruits and vegetables using synthetic pesticides as appropriate and as needed. Some recent results that may be interesting, uh, just in 2017, the, the, the high, the corn record in the, in the US was um, from David Hula in Virginia. Uh, he had 542 bushels an acre, and in 2019, he got up to 616 bushels an acre. Okay, so the interesting here is that he's, he's got a whole eco-agriculture approach going on. He's doing regular tissue testing. He's using soil bio microbiology and foliar nutrients. He's using products from Genesis Ag, Genesis Ag and Brandt. Uh, so, and then another one was the really popular amongst pumpkin growers and some, some places is trying to grow giant pumpkins. So a few years back, the giant world record pumpkin who was raised with uh, the soil mineralization scheme that based on William Albrecht that was popular with um, the ideal soil book that Michael Estera wrote. They had that going on and they also had some bio biological amendments going on. Okay, so in um, after, after I worked for the Extension Service, I went and managed an organic farm in uh, Missouri and then I wound up working for the ATRA. Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, which is part of the National Center for Public Technology. And uh, I was there for 18 years. And this, and I joined them in 1989. So by 1991, we were already publishing this. Uh, this was the Alternative Soil Testing Laboratories list. And what we did based on that was ATRA would take questions from farmers and we, we would often get asked, hey, where can I send my soil test for to get a, a good uh, analysis that supports my organic farm or my sustainable farm or my eco farm. You know, um, you know, at that time there, you know, it was pretty limited what, what you could get from, from, you know, standard commercial soils labs or university labs. So this evolved is still, I think they still published on their webpage, but um, it's kind of offers farmers a, 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 a broader range of tests and ideas. And so some of those are the classic chemistry and mineral Test, but these are geared to more or less Albrecht or Reams or some kind of innovative analysis. Uh, so you see a bunch of different labs there, Brookside Labs, Kinsey Labs, Logan Labs, Midwestern Bioag, et cetera. So um, then another group of lab, soil labs would offer things that are, are more along the lines that have really good analysis for the organic matter, the humus, the soil biology, the soil food web. And so you see a bunch of those on there as well. So that, that, um, that led to this, and this was in the year 2000, uh, Acres USA um, called me up and asked me to do a, a large general session lecture on an eco farming primer. And let me see, let's see this deal here. <coughs> So yeah, this, the Zooms put a, um, a thing on the top of my screen. So let's see. Okay, so let, let, me, let me pick back up here. I was trying to do something, a technical thing with the way the Zoom is displaying my screen. 
So, all right. So as I said, so Acres USA wanted a primer on eco-agriculture. And, and here it is, I guess, what, 15 years later after I'd started going to the conference and I would try to go as many as I can. And I've been taking eco-farm seminars with various people like, you know, Dan Scow and Arden Anderson and Neil Kinsey and all these people. And so, so what I did was uh, I thought about it and I really boiled it down to this, the three pillars of eco-agriculture are minerals, biology, and energy. And when we talk about that, minerals include a lot. That includes your soil test and then various types of applications, rock dust and rock, rock minerals. And then a big emphasis on mineral balancing in the Albrecht or Reams tradition and some of these other consultants. And then foliar fertilization and fertigation. The biology is, yeah, that's soil biology and the soil food web, but the way that you get that is by managing humus. So organic matter management, humus management, uh, cover crops, compost, crop rotations, proper tillage, grazing, multi-species cover crops, multi-species grazing, microbial inoculants. That's all involved there. It's a big topic. And then the last one is energy. This is the one that is, um, I, I consider to be the emerging field. I think that I think we're we've come out of World War II. We've gone through the chemistry era. We're in the soil, we're in the biology area, and I think our next era will be on. It will be a really big emphasis on subtle energy. So, but we're gonna get into that later, but that includes things like everything from cellular metabolism, photosynthesis, uh, redox, biofield, electromagnetic and scalar energy, paramagnetic and subtle energies. So that's what we're gonna talk about. So let's, let's start with one of the pioneers, Dr. William Albrecht. He was a premier soil scientist. He uh, started at the University of Missouri in around 1920. And then he worked all the way through the 1950s and then had a post-retirement. And it, during his post-retirement, he helped private labs like Brookside Labs get started and, and become professional soils labs. Uh, he was real instrumental in early Acres USA magazine and, and conferences. And he was talking about cation uh, saturation and mineral balancing for nutrition and health plus yields. And so if we look at some of the cool things he did, for example, here's up on the upper left. This was a trial he did where he did he raised spinach and changed the ratios of calcium and nitrogen. And when spinach was fertilized with more calcium and nitrogen, they produced more proteinaceous plant material, which repelled sap sucking thrips. And on the bottom two rows where they had insufficient nutrition, you can see all kinds of holes in those leaves. And that's why, that's why he would always talk about nutrition of plants and how insects are nature, nature scavengers. And he did things like he would raise uh, forage in a pasture. He would fertilize, he would take the soil test, he would fertilize it. And then he would actually raise the forage to rabbits. And he would grow those rabbits for several generations. And he, he considered this biological feeding test to be the appropriate way to understand proper nutrition. And he wouldn't really rely on some of his soil fertilization recommendations until he had seen this. And so he did other things. He, he, he did all kinds of stuff with, um, after World, and during, you know, during World War II, they, they analyzed dental records of soldiers and he equated those based on where they live in the country with the way the climate and the geology and the how much rainfall they're getting is it leached in the eastern United States or is it uh, you know does it produce more carbohydrate uh, st style foods or more protein style foods? And so the other thing about Albrecht and when you're talking about um, soil mineral balancing is understanding the cation exchange complex and how the clay humus particles in the soil are very tiny. They're, we're talking about the almost like the nanosphere. We're, we're in the range of one, one millionth of a meter to one billionth of a meter when we're talking about this. And this is the colloidal complex where clay and humus have huge surface areas. But they also have these electrostatically uh, negatively charged uh, sites that attract cations that are positively charged, like calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and trace elements. And so these are adsorbed on there, and, they, and all these exchange sites are very important. And when we talk about it, cation exchange capacity, we have a soils like a sandy soil will have a lower um, cation exchange capacity because it has fewer sites. 
and it's more susceptible to leaching the nutrients. It requires uh, less lime and, and fertilizers to alter the fertility and uh, has less water holding capacity. Then you get into a clay soil, really high cation exchange capacity, has better retention of nutrients, um, and then uh, has better water holding capacity and so forth. But um, the way that's done on a soil test, and this is what um, Albrecht came up with, and this, this just wasn't something that, um, um, this came out of the air. He actually did lab tests and did this for years and years and years and determined that as soil was 68% calcium and then a ratio of magnesium and potassium and sodium is a proper ratio for good soil tilth and good soil structure, providing habitat for soil microbiology and for good nutrition in, of the plants. Now, this is not set in stone and later in life when Albrecht was retired, he started working with Western soils and, and uh, this, he, the range that he came up with was more like um, 60 to 85% calcium. So there, there's a good range there to work with. Uh, so here it is, there's the 60 to 80% uh, uh, calcium and then magnesium, potassium, sodium and so forth. So it really pays attention to not only nutrient levels, but the ratios between cations and anions and trace elements. And then, for example, if you get into Michael Astaire's work, he talks about calcium to, to boron ratio, the iron to manganese ratio, zinc to copper, iron to zinc, phosphorus to potassium, and sulfur to potassium ratios. So that, um, that's very widely known. Uh, also kind of um, still gets critique amongst the soil science community, but if you read some of their papers, I don't think they really understand what the, the aim that Albrecht was really after. So uh, anyways, it's still very popular with soil consultants working in eco-agriculture. The other pioneer I wanna mention is uh, Kerry Reams. Kerry Reams was um, a fascinating guy. He was a uh, veteran of World War II. He, he, in, he got injured in a Jeep accident, he was uh, injured and then he was healed and he spent a lifetime helping farmers grow healthy foods. He had a laboratory down in Florida and his concept was um, people were asking him to, for health reasons and he, he figured out that I cannot help people be healthy unless they have healthy nutritious foods. So uh, there's a Ream soil test is really based on the Morgan soil test out of uh, Connecticut it mimics the ability of plants to access nutrients in low, weak uh, organic acids. And then a lot of emphasis on monitoring the soils and crops. They use a, commonly use an electrical conductivity meter and a bricks meter for, re, for um, yeah, a, a, a refractometer to measure bricks. He talked about anionic and cationic growth a little differently than the way it's used and big emphasis on foliar fertilization. But the thing about Reams is that his concept was really based about the energy, the energy of elements and how they respond to each other and how they move in ionization and have resistance and create energy. And so that was what he was after. And this is the, um, this is like the optimum Reams ratios. And, and you can see the calcium magnesium. You'll see uh, phosphate to potash at two to one. Sometimes you'll see them at one to one. Uh, you see nitrate, ammonia, one to one, and um, you know, so on. So there's a couple labs that work in this area, different consultants. Uh, now, one of the unique things that Kerry Reams came up with that is very popular across the board in eco agriculture and organic farming now is using a refractometer to measure the bricks of fruits and vegetables. And now the, the refractometer is definitely a precision optical instrument. It, there's nothing hokey about it. It is used in many industries. Uh, sometimes when you go get your antifreeze change in your car, they'll use a refractometer. When wine growers are at the end of the season, they're getting ready to harvest, they'll test the grapes for, for the soluble solids for the bricks. But what was unique is how Reams came up with a, a, a novel use of the refractometer, and that is to measure the poor, average, good, and excellent BRICS levels of fruits and vegetables. So for example, if you 
you get you get so you get some apples and you you know you have a, a Brix reading of six versus one of eighteen, you can tell the difference. I mean, there's a night and day difference between some of these things. And so you do the same thing with carrots. Uh, you know, you can see that really sweet carrots and so forth. And so uh, this understanding is, um, like I said, it's been broadly, uh, you know, distributed across alternative farming. A lot of people will find this very interesting and useful. So then um, Acres USA also has a publishing uh, arm. And these are some of the big books, Neil Kinsey, uh, Gary Zimmer, Dan Scow, William Albrecht, Don Schieffer, and then this other guy, Tejans. It's a little harder to find, but um, yeah, when when um, Albrecht was talking about 85% calcium saturation, this is the work that Tejans had, and he was um, he was a soil scientist and, and um, grew crops at, at Rutgers University actually. So the other thing is okay, so that's Kind of mineral balancing. There's a whole other area that is generally known as remineralization. This was really popular with rock dusts and with sea solids and sea minerals. And the concept here is that the earth evolved with all these elements and they are part of the earth mineral complex. They wash down into the sea. And when you work deal with rock dust and sea minerals, you're, you're dealing with over 70 different elements. Now they're really in trace amounts and ultra trace amounts. There are some secondary elements in there that you'll find at a little bigger concentration. But the concept here is not to be applying like potassium or magnesium. The concept is to have a smorgasbord of, of elements that plants and microbes can use. They recognize them. And even though we don't consider them some of these things to be plant essential elements, it seems that the plants and microbes know how to use them. And so these are very popular, and you'll see examples like this. This is, um, this is a sea solution mineral used on the right, and farmers see this. They see how it increases the vitality of the roots and the health of the plant, and they like it. And so there's a, a big use of sea minerals and rock dusts. And there's some really good books out there. Maynard Murray was, here was another medical doctor like, like Reams. He, was, he had patients who were, uh, who needed help and he felt like the best way to, to help them would be to raise nutritious crops that have uh, really fully mineralized. So he developed this method of doing sea solids and uh, he's got a patent on that. You can read some of his stuff. Um, and then uh, other books, there's a couple other books there on sea minerals and um, the one on the right there, that is, um, that's the one that is the sea crop. Uh, ocean, uh, ocean minerals out of Washington State. And then rock powders, Harvey Lyle, uh, healing power of minerals, Paul Mergner, et cetera. Okay, so I'm gonna take you back. This is um, from my early work when I was an extension horticulture agent, ag agent in Oklahoma. This was a soil test that Oklahoma State University was offering back then. And so I wanna take you through that and look at that. So you've got, you've got pH on there. Uh, you got the buffer index, which is an indicator of how much lime you need. Uh, it's got the phosphorus, it's got potassium, and that's it. <laughs> that's it. That is, that's all that was offered on the common soil test. And that's what I'm talking about. Farmers would get this and they would say, really, is that all? Is that all, I, is that all the information that I can get? And so this is why some of these alternative soil testing labs have emerged. That's why they have a big following. Uh, and uh, so here's an example. This is, oh, actually the, um, the computer messed that up. So anyways, uh, what you're seeing here is a, um, this is a peri ag lab soil test. Anyways, you've got cations change capacity. You have organic matter, pH. You have your anions, which include nitrogen, sulfate, and phosphate. You've got your cations, which are calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and it tells you what the ratios are. And then here's the second page, then here's the trace elements you've got. So it talks about iron, manganese, copper, zinc, but also uh, boron, cobalt, molybdenum, molybdenum, <laughs> molybdenum, and then your base saturation, your percent base saturation. So here's the ideal 
here's the calcium magnesium ratio and you see this one is low this guy's really going to need some lime over there and and so forth so then there's percentages so that's the kind of soil test that's available i call this one the holistic soil test this is what's driving this interest in mineralization and doing mineral balancing schemes and aiming for nutrient dense crops then uh, the other one is I want to mention is on non-toxic pest control is the trophobios biosis uh, theory from Francis Chabotchou. He was a plant pathologist in France up into the 1980s. And he talked about a paradigm shift from toxic chemistry to promoting a really healthy plant by monitoring its status for nutrients and, and then encouraging the um, better um, metabolism from free amino acids into proteins and reducing these in the plant sap that, that attract insects into the monitor. So in other words, monitoring the sap, monitoring the soil, trying to work with uh, ratio of elements and to promote this um, healthier plants with proteins and polysaccharides. And so one of the examples from this is the work of Anna Prima Vesey. So she was a really well-known soil ecologist down in South America. And so this early paper, actually, uh, Shabochu refers to this. Uh, her paper in 1972 is the influence of nutritional balances on patty rice um, resistance to blast. And so look at this. So on healthy plants versus diseased plants, look at the ratio of calcium magnesium, potassium to calcium, phosphorus to sulfur, nitrogen to copper, phosphorus to manganese, and iron to manganese. And look at the differences. And so that's what she found. And then she did this again in 1995. She did the same thing again. She looked at the, um, the nutrient levels and then also combined with EM or micro, effective microorganisms and found something similar. So I thought that was an interesting um, paper to illustrate. So, now, so that's a real quick introduction to mineral, mineralization, soil testing, and so forth. Now we're going to go and touch on uh, biology, and let's look at some of these things. So this is something that farmers will observe over time, is the difference between organic matter and the soil. You can see this is 2% versus 4% on the right. And people respond to that, and here's over 20 years, this is the reason why. This is at Rodale, and the one on the left just had crop residues. The one on the right had crop residues and cover crops and animal manure. And so they were able to build this soil organic matter over time. This is a real big part of eco farming, basically biological farming practices that influence soil, soil organic matter and the soil food web. A real popular book back in the day, not very many people have this now, but back in the day, Feed the Soil. And uh, this was uh, by Edwin McLeod. And it was this not a cute little story about this rabbit that goes out to live in the country and become a farmer and he's digging in the soil and eat more the worm comes up and has this conversation it's like it's like krishna and and arjun in the bhagavad gita this conversation between the rabbit and the worm and the worm tells this whole story about how to feed the soil organic matter and to use cover crops and that's what this book about it's a guide to green manures cover crops and cultivated legumes and so feed the soil is feed the organic matter don't disturb it as, as you know as, uh, as much as possible and encourage this habitat so and then i always like to throw in we have a lot of options with cover crops we have cool season species we got warm season there's just no end to the kind of cover crops and i, I was at a conference once in ohio and a farmer said no matter where you live there's some kind of cover crop that will match your cropping system that you can fit in there and then this is at our farm. There's all kinds of ways of using them. Living mulches in the alleyways between plastic culture beds, cover crop strips on the side, under sown. Like if you're doing fall brassicas, you can throw some clover on there. You're probably not going to get in there until that field when the fall brassicas are done. It's just going to sit there over winter. So you get some clovers on there. Winter killed mulches. These all have a really big benefit. Then um, this gets into uh, the, the another tradition of the biodynamic tradition and is using what are called humified composts, where you add clay e soil to the compost. And here's an example on the left. This was a compost that was available from a real popular 
Landscape and Nursery Center there in Austin, Texas, where I lived. And you'll notice, you'll see different bark, different kind of uh, sticks that are in there. And this is, this is finished. They're selling this to gardeners. You can take that home and put it in your garden. Uh, but it's, it's, um, it's fluffy, it's not structured, and it's not really, really been completely humified. So it's a good source. It's a good source of organic matter, but it's not as good as it can be. And this one on the right is from Jeff Poppins' farm, the biodynamic farmer in Tennessee. And this is where he's added some soil to it. He's added the biodynamic preparations to it. And it's really prepared a really nice colloidal and spongy kind of a compost that is structured. And if you look at the difference between these in the microscope, you can easily see the difference. And the one on the right will also have humic substances that when you extract into a compost extract and spray it out there, you're actually not only adding biology, but humic particles. So compost quality matters and how you make compost. This is part of the spectrum of humus management, understanding this. Another real, this is a real popular one nowadays. This is the Johnson Sioux bioreactor. A lot of people are getting into this. The reason is you look at that, look at the fungal to bacterial ratio. And this is what I call an ecosystem compost. Actually, there's other people that are doing that. Mark Sturgis up in Oregon, he does ecosystem compost. It's basically less disturbance. And you're not tilling, you, let, you keep it moist and let the biology just develop on its own over a very long period of time. And look how, look how the fungal bacterial ratio gets up there. So this is, this is really popular nowadays. And if you look at, you take a teaspoon of the compost, you put it in a Dixie cup, swish it with water. This is what you're gonna get. This is the microbiology that you can extract, the microflora, the bacteria and the fungi, and then microfaunal grazers, the protozoa nematodes. So that's what people are after, you know, all this microbiology. And there's many, many species of each one of these groups. Uh, the other important thing is to talk about biospheres. They're the rhizosphere and the phylosphere. These are the, the three-dimensional zones on the root and leaf surfaces. It's not just um, um, you know, a barren wasteland, two-dimensional. It's three-dimensional. There's a ton of activity going on there. It's just important to recognize that. And then also, when you have healthy soils, you see these rhizosheaths, where the, the few millimeters of soil that cling to the roots. That's a really good indicator. And then also people nowadays talk about root exudates. This, this has been around for actually many decades. People are now trying really um, becoming aware of that. But here's the reason why. This is really good. This is why you have cover crops and you have biological farming and encourage this soil food web around the roots is because look at that with, um, you can have as many two different, two dozen different kinds of amino acids, nearly 20 organic acids, sugars, vitamins, nucleic acids, enzymes, and sloughed off roots. These are the kinds of things that are happening at the root zone. So when all that's put together, this is what a good soil crumb structure looks like. And farmers refer to this as black cottage cheese. And you want that, you wanna see this. When uh, you add water to this, it will hold its, its, it will retain its structure instead of puddling. And you'll have good water infiltration. You have good porosity there. You have habitat for soil microbiology. You have a lot of exchange sites, a lot of colloidal activity happening there. So we talk about soil organic matter functioning. This is a real key concept is that soil organic matter is at the heart of all the three components of the soil, the physical, chemical, and biological components of the soil. And then you see a lot of activity going on there. So uh, on the biological side, it, it's the engine, the carbon is the engine for energy and food and habitat for the soil microbial community, but really slow release nutrients and suppression of soil borne diseases. On the chemical side, you have exchange capacity, buffering the soil pH, cementing soil particles, formation of clay humus. And on the physical side, improving the soil structure and aggregate stability, we just talked about increasing the water holding capacity, modifying the soil color, so I want to, this is for me is a take home message is, is soil organic matter functioning. That's the, that is what you're doing with biological farming is aiming for that. And one more thing, and that is the soil food web or soil microbial community functioning. And we just talked about these zones, the rhizosphere and the phylosphere. These are where you can have action. You can influence those, those living spheres by promoting soil biology and, and foliar applications and so forth. Um, you have plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, you have symbiotic and saprophytic fungi, and then they perform all kinds of functions. There's just a brief list here, but
But this is the big concept is having this, this biological farming practices, promoting the soil organic matter and the soil uh, uh, food web functioning. So you have bacterial and fungal decomposers, nitrogen fixers, carbon fixers, transformation availability of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, phosphorus solubilizing bacteria, really big. Um, then biological control of diseases and insects, phytohormones and bioactive substances, and then really important, these organic acids and these soil enzymes, and then these slimes and glues and cements that whole, hold soil particles together. And then finally, when you put all that together, this is the MIN concept. This also came out of eco-agriculture. This is from Graham Sait uh, with Nutritech Solutions in Australia. And this is the microbially enhanced nutrient delivery concept. And that the MIN concept says the higher the density and diversity of microbes on the root and leaf surfaces, the better the nutrient availability. So that gets and on a practical basis, that is where people get into micro mineral blends and use them in both fertigation, foliar applications. And as a result, there are there's farms that are reducing their fertilizer input by 25 to 75% when you use this whole integrated approach, minerals and biology working together. And so, okay, so now this is the third component and this one is on energy and this one we'll, we'll get into here. So this one is gonna talk about photosynthesis and electromagnetic and scalar energies and so forth. So this, so I think it, help, it is helpful to pause and reflect on the chronology of life on earth. And this is actually appropriate for all three of these. So over billions of years, the earth's been around and early on it was a planet full of minerals and volcanoes. It was a fiery cauldron of minerals. And then we had very simple primitive bacteria that started living on the earth about 4 billion years ago. Then they developed the ability to, to do photosynthesis. And then fungi emerged a couple billion years ago, and then multicellular life, and then animals, and then plants. What's interesting is that plants and mycorrhizae evolved uh, roughly around the same time. And so we've learned about microbi mycorrhizae, you know, it's been really learned a lot in the last few decades, but it's been around for 400 million years. So we talk about rock dust and we talk about roots and microbiology. They all, they all evolve together. So that's really important to understand that concept. The other thing to recognize is that all of this life evolved with a barrage of both earth and cosmic energies. And so the, the reason that life exists is because it's in natural balance with these energies. And so that's an important concept. So this is on uh, the bioenergy. So a few points here is that uh, all life from single-celled microorganisms to multi-celled mammals evolved with a natural barrage of earthly and cosmic energies. Uh, telluric solar planetary energies. Next is another important concept is just bioenergetics. Plain bioenergetics that is part of the life sciences is the biochemistry of living plants and animal organisms involve natural energetic processes, cellular growth and metabolism, catabolic and anabolic, which is breakdown and buildup. Breakdown and buildup happens at the cellular level and it happens in humus level. When you take manure and leaves and straw and put them in a compost pile, they're decomposed first and then they're reformed and transformed into humus. That's what that is. And then you have redox, the exchange of stealing electrons, giving electrons, glycolysis, which produces adenosine triphosphate, the Krebs citric acid cycle, which produces proteins and, and other molecules and then photosynthesis are all modulated by enzymes. And, and many of these enzymes require trace elements that function as metallic catalysts for these enzymatic reactions. And then biophysics, let's look at that. This is the study of energetic life processes at the cellular, subcellular, and subatomic quantum levels through the integration of physics, chemistry, and math, including what people can say are frontier sciences. Then another, a few other things is understanding natural earthly and cosmic energies with healthy influence. 
that are on the extremely low frequency range that, that biological life evolved with versus an emerging class of harmful uh, electromagnetic frequencies from, from cell towers, from cell phones, from TVs and computer monitors and all that. And so one thing you can make a, a connection here is that in, and this may be helpful for farmers, when farmers are work, growing crops, they know that you, you, you know, if you're growing tomatoes, there are certain diseases that, that will be a challenge for growing a tomato crop. If you're growing cucurbits, there are certain pathogenic diseases that will be a challenge for growing melons and, and watermelons and pumpkins and so forth. So, um, but in, in soil biology, we have these uh, plant pathogenic um, organisms like early blight and tomatoes, like anthracnose and cucurbits. And we, but on the other hand, we have a huge class of beneficial soil microorganisms. We have bacillus, we have all these different, um, you know, uh, microorganisms that are really beneficial. Then we also have um, what the food safety people are worried about are pathogenic uh, organisms that cause humans to become sick, like E. coli and salmonella. But the, by and large, the majority of all these microorganisms that people are working with in organic agriculture are beneficial. And so the, the same thing here is understanding that there's the same thing with these earthly and cosmic energies, that you have these really healthy, beneficial, extremely low frequencies that are common to biological life, and then you have these harmful ones and understanding the difference between them and then how to work with them. And so this gets into crossover technology between holistic health and holistic agriculture, both with references and how-to knowledge. And it leads to a library of concepts and terminologies, modalities and devices for the eco-farmers toolbox. So a few things I'll, I'll mention that, um, like I said, there's, um, holistic health, there's um, energetic agriculture, quantum agriculture is a term that is, is kind of encompasses a lot of this. And then broad terms and mechanisms like bioresonance and biofield, biophotons, pulse electromagnetic frequencies, scalar and torsion fields, uh, and plasma. And uh, those are part of the working paradigm of biophysics nowadays. And then some really ancient descriptions of these, um, these subtle energies like etheric and prana and chi or ki. Uh, and, and so understanding those, they're also part of re-emerging physics. And then with a goal really of increasing the energetic vitality of living systems. And so when you get down to the bottom, you're into more like the modalities and devices. So there are scalar devices, there are scalar pendants and there's energy plates and coils, ormus uh, minerals, agrohomeopathy, biodynamic preparations, radionics, dowsing, seed treatments with pyramid energy, orgone energy, magnetic energy, vortex and structured water, geometric shapes and structures and plasma. All of this is part of this um, bioenergy field that we're talking about. So here's an example. This, um, this was a book that came out some years ago. This was The Truth About Food uh, the, by Gillian, Gillian Drake. And what you're looking at is a way of dowsing to understand the, the life energy level of these different um, uh, food sources. And it's not on a scale known as bovis. On the bovis scale, uh, anything above 6,500 is considered life promoting, and then below 6,500 is, is on the lower level that leads further and further towards decay and, um, and, and poor health and, and so forth. So, um, so this is, I think this was on, is on fruit juice, and you can kind of see here that it goes up this way and down this way. So that was interesting. I think she also had one here on, yeah, this is one uh, baby food. So this was a measuring that um, the bovis energy of baby food. And so this is a, this is a, a modality that people use and, and then um, based on that, you have better information 
on help, taking care of your, your health and your family's health. Here's another simple one. I just pulled this off the web. I would like to repeat this one and verify it, but here's uh, just a basil put in tap water after one week versus basil put in structured water after one week. And this is a substantial difference. And so that's what structured water does, running, running water through vortex and through structured water devices is enlivens the water. It does something to the, the resonant frequency of the water, uh, et cetera. So then just a few examples um, in the biodynamic world, they got the biodynamic preparations. This one is the horn manure or the BD500. It's really on, uh, if you look down there, it's uh, promoting humus formation in the soil. So you also have the cow patty pit or the barrel compost. You have the Pfeiffer um, field and garden spray or the Pfeiffer compost starter. And this one, um, this is how they describe it in biodynamics. This one is, has more of a calcium influence versus a silica influence. It promotes lateral growth and humus formation. It's, it's applied in the evening. It's uh, applied fresh soil, coarse drops, and it has, has more of an influence on etheric and physical bodies. And then the balance to this one is the horn silica, the 501. This has got the silica ground up quartz that's put in the horn manure. Also, uh, equisetum or horsetail has silica in it. It promotes more upright growth. And it's sprayed in the morning and fine drops, and it, it influences more astral and spirit bodies. Now, now the interesting thing is I've, I've done farm walkabouts and pointed out this, this, you'll see this kind of growth habit in plants all the time. And I've, I've, I was on a farm one time and they really lacked this upright growth. They could really use uh, spraying this field spray of the 501. All the plants were just all lateral. It was, it was really crazy. So it was really out of balance there. So, uh, but here's my point. I want to bring this is how this all ties together is that, um, so you take these field sprays and you mix them into water in this vortex fashion. It's called dynamization. You stir it one direction, create a vortex, then you create organization, then you stop and come back the other direction. And uh, what happens is the, soil, the, wa the water picks up information from the bottom net preparations. And water is known to be, have the ability to do this. And people call this information copies or the memory of water. And here's a couple of machines that are used. Steve Storch up in New York. This is the other one on the right is from a vineyard in France. And then the flow forms that John Wilkes and other guys developed is another way to do this. And there's this rhythmic pattern, this pulsating pattern where water flows nat through natural systems. And so that's what structured water is about is recreating the natural uh, ability of water to have uh, be enlivened, to pick up information and be healthy. And so there's a number of books along this line. You've got the books by Theodore Schwenk and his son and then books about Bio, uh, Victor Schauberger, and then the flow forms, and then biocrystallization. And it's a, there's a whole rich history of this, talking about uh, implosion or the centripetal force versus centrifugal. Dynamization, potentization, using homeopathy, and then various kinds of qualitative analysis to look at all this. Uh, here's an example, very interesting. So this is the flow forms work. And there on the, on the lower left, you see these forms they came up with. These are geometric straight shapes that water flows through. And because of the projected geometry that they figured out and the way they specifically have organized these shapes and the rhythmic way the water flows through there, and it influences wheat seed and how much wheat seed grows and produces roots. So this, all you're looking at here is how the water was treated. And, and all this root growth down here is from running them through these different geometric shapes. And then the International Conference of Physics, Chemistry, and Biology of Water has been going on for many years. Uh, all, almost all of this is online. It's a great source from many great speakers, Gerald Pollack, um, who is very popular nowadays. Nowadays, got the, yeah, there it is. <laughs> the fourth phase of water, and then uh, Igor, German, these other guys, and talked about the anomalous properties of water, that it has liquid crystal, crystalline structure, it's a dipole, has dielectric properties, and which all lend itself to function as an information carrier. 
And then all this provides technical support for biodynamic preparations, for agrohomeopathy, for revitalizing living systems with implosion technology and so forth. So then I think finally is this uh, whole um, topic can be, uh, it's got a wealth of knowledge behind it in medicine, bioelectric and subtle energy medicine. There's a great book called Life Force, The Scientific Basis, Breakthrough Physics and Ener Energy Medicine and so forth. And it's got thousands of references in there. Books on biomagnetism and paramagnetism and then a whole database of information on John Keeley, Walter Russell, and Nikola, Nikolai Tesla. So some, a few references there to, to draw upon. Okay. Okay. <laughs> ben, thanks there for you the, go. <laughs> thanks for the overview, Steve. Yeah. Let's see. Um, yeah, um, I'm just going to be sharing a couple of the questions here. I've noticed that, that the chat has been entirely silent uh, for the entire the entire hour you were speaking. No one texted anything in the chat, so I'm just going to assume that means they were paying close attention to you uh, throughout, as um, I know I was. And uh, thank you for bringing everyone up to date on what you <laughs> have been integrating. Um, so I'm just going to drop a couple um, softballs to you. Well, there's and a few questions on here. Do you see yeah. that on the uh, question, question and answer? Anson has a question about um, redox and types of calcium uh, affecting plant uptake availability for microbiology. You, you touched on redox, but you didn't give us too much. Yeah, and uh, you could probably address that better than I can, Dan. Because didn't you have didn't you do an interview with Oliver? No, that was, John. Assign? that was John. Oh, that was John. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no comment on Redux. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think I'll try to um, address that. I can. I can refer to the uh, excellent papers by by this. Uh, I think he's a French guy who's figured all this out. But uh, so without without trying to tell you specifically what it is, let me put it in context. So one of the experiences that have come out of the alternative health and alternative agriculture is called biological terrain assessment or BTA. And um, Claude de Vicente was a French guy. He was, a, he was an engineer who looked at water and he developed this whole concept about testing the pH and electrical conductivity and redox of water and, and that you could determine the health, healthy kinds of water for people and so forth with this. And so then Reams does, uh, in addition to um, agriculture, Reams has a whole human health test. They test urine, they test saliva, they test the pH and electrical conductivity, ammoniums and nitrates. And based on that, which is a biological terrain assessment, they can tell the metabolism of people and how healthy they are. And are they losing energy or are they gaining energy? What kind of balance are they in? So that's what the redox is about. And that's where people are exploring that in, in agriculture. And there's some good references on that. But, but in general, again, you know, you're talking about um, giving electrons or stealing electrons. And so you also get into antioxidants. And to put that in perspective, you know, we, the reason we have fruits and vegetables in our diet is because they provide antioxidants through uh, bioflavonoids and lycopenes and all these different things. They plant secondary metabolites. They're considered antioxidants. And so they fight free radicals and they're very healthy for us. So, uh, and then, you know, also when you're, when you're brewing EM micro, uh, effective microorganisms, you can measure that with an ORP oxidation reduction meter, and you can get really high antioxidants produced from these microbes. And there are, that's very powerful because then they can have more, or more ability to remediate systems like hog lagoons and, and um, poultry CAFOs and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, do you want to just respond to the questions in the Q&A yourself? I don't have to inter Let's see. engage them. Let's see. So I, I don't, and uh, yeah, and that, I don't mean to, um, come up short on redox, but it's, it's a complicated topic and I don't probably understand all of that myself. I know how to tell you where to get it, 
<laughs> I think I don't think anybody in the states is doing very much with it yet. It's probably it's a big learning curve, and I think has a big opportunity for us. How large was the pumpkin? I don't know, but it was the world setting pumpkin. I think they're up to 1,600 pounds or more nowadays. Uh, let's see. Have you worked uh, with biochar as a soil biology stimulant? Uh, let's see. And um, can you, is it more effective inoculating? Can you, can you comment on that? So in biochar, let's just talk about biochar in general. Now, biochar is a really fascinating area. Uh, it's popular and people are exploring biochar because of terra preta. That there's no doubt about it. The, the explorers of the Amazon came across vast villages of people that lived in the Amazon. They, there was a population at, that rivaled any European city when the very first Europeans explored the Amazon. And however, at, at that time, they also introduced, inter, introduced the European diseases, something as simple as a flu. So there was a huge population crash. And then over time, people discovered that where these villages were located had these incredibly rich, dark, fertile soils or these black Amazonian soils that were called terra preta, the very rich. But because of these villages and the way people lived, they had fires going all the time. They had human manure. They had these middens where people would throw all their stuff out there, including pay plots. And so over time, these soils developed these dark, rich soils called terra preta. And so people are interested in using charcoal and biochar to enrich the soil. A few things to say about that is that uh, one is that if your soil is pretty good already, a lot of our temperate soils have a lot of natural fertility, you're not going to see probably as big a response. If you look at the Amazon soils, they have extremely low cation exchange capacity, uh, like 2%, 1.5 or, or 2 or 3. And now there's an interesting parallel. If you look in the United States, where will you find those kind of soils? And you'll find them along the Gulf Coastal Plain and along the Atlantic Coastal Plain where people have very sandy soils, very low cation exchange capacity, low fertility. Those soils would be very much more amenable to using biochar. So that's one thing to, to say about it. However, the next thing that is the, where the cutting edge is, and that is activating or charging biochar with basically putting the char with into a compost pile and letting it sit in there for months at a time. What happens is it will, it'll, it will help break down the hydrophobic properties of biochar and it'll be more conducive to, to work absorbing water. And also microbiology will start to inhabit the pore spaces of biochar. And that's what's really appealing about biochar. It has this porosity and then it can be loaded like, it's like an apartment condominium where um, fungal hyphae and bacteria can live in there. And so it can be very positive. So there now people are looking at, some of the scientists were, the early soil scientist research was looking at 25 tons 50 tons of biochar per acre, just outrageous. No, no farmer could ever afford that. So the cutting edge right now is looking at 500 pounds per acre or less than a thousand pounds per acre that has been activated and, and charged up and gone through this bioweathering process. So um, yeah, I've got some research uh, that I will be doing this year in the greenhouse and I hope to answer that question some more. So that, that's one on the biochar. Okay, Dan, what else? Biogeom biogeometry? Go for it. Choose the ones you want. Biogeometry. Uh, how does it fit into the energetic of agriculture and how can we apply it in our operations? Okay, so I got this library here, and if I could, I could pull it out, I could show it to you. It's called Shape Power. There's a book called Shape Power, and you, it's, uh, you can find it online and download it. Basically, geometry matters. And so that's why you'll see, uh, in, in, if you look up a term, the term sacred geometry, 
in energy coils and so forth that they all matter. And so, um, so, and then biogeometry, there's a whole category around that. Um, there's the, um, let's see, hang on just a second. I'll give you, there's two sources. I got my, I got my celestial background here. Right, here's one of them, does that, whoa, there's one of them. This one is by Ibrahim, Ibrahim Karim, and he's the Egyptian guy who's got a whole uh, workshop and book and toolkit around biogeometry. That's kind of a specific application of it. The other uh, person that you can find online with a lot of good information on that is Dan Winter. So, um, but let's just say uh, a, a big category is electromagnet culture. There's actually a really big movement happening in France and Belgium right now with electromagnet culture. And in the spectrum of bioenergetics, we could say that there's some that are basically part of normal physics and, and then there's stuff that's pretty far out. I would say the electromagnet culture is on the more you know, acceptable part of physics. So it really just is taking advantage of the natural frequencies that we're bombarded with and using different practices to, to, as an antenna, to bring those energies into the soil and, enlighten, and, and promote plant health. So for example, a paramagnetic tower, which is a, um, a pipe that's filled with paramagnetic rock dust and is buried in the earth, would be known to be part of that. And to get back to biogeometry, these same people are using copper pyramids and setting them over trays of plants and getting better plant growth from the trays that have the pyramid over them than the trays that don't have a pyramid over them. Okay, so that's on, that's on the biogeometry. Let's see what else. Uh, if you, you mentioned a lot of different topics, what do you consider the most important ones to have the biggest effect on crop health? Okay, that's a good question. And we did the three parts, minerals, biology, and energy. And what I want to say is that it's always the integration of minerals and biology that matters. And, and we have this tendency nowadays in the way people discuss things and the way that certain promote, people are promoted to guru, guru levels. And they, they're, they're a pioneer and they're a guru because they know a lot. They know a whole lot and they're, they're really promoting what they know, which is soil biology or they're promoting minerals. But if you back up, it's and if you if you kind of listen to what the the more experienced farmers are doing and what the the kind of you know kind of level-headed consultants are doing, it's not all one or the other. It's that you need to have this balance of a good soil test and a good mineral program working for you, as well as these biological farming principles that are promoting soil organic matter and soil health and, and soil biology. When you have that working together, you have better health of the plants. And that can, that's all straightforward, people. That's, that's a soil test, coming back with a mineralization program, doing some fertigation, some foliar feeding, and encouraging natural humus management, and then maybe adding some microbes in there. And so, yeah, it makes farming fun and plants healthy. Okay, so let's see about uh, rainwater. Can you enhance rainwater if you go through a series of buckets? Well, you can, you can do structured water devices, enhance rainwater. Rainwater by itself is pretty good, but you can enhance any kind of water with structured water devices. Um, let's see, the book Humosphere talks about assimilation of large uh, molecules such as amino acids. Yes, that's true. Um, your experience of this, basically there's, there's a whole knowledge base and, and Bargila Retiever was one of the pioneers I mentioned and she has a term for that. Um, but basically is that plants assimilate these large molecules, amino acids and glycine and so forth, not just ions. Uh, so I think the point there is that a healthy system, you'll have that working for you. You don't have a lot of control over that. Can you put up the pin ultimate slide with quantum references? Uh, let's see, hold on. Okay, well, I will later. Um, and then I, would, I should mention uh, that 
I'm not sure if um, Dan is the, are these slides going to be recorded or what's your um, plan? Presentation is recorded. Um, when you want to make the slides available, it's up to you. Okay. I, let's um, let's get through the whole thing and we'll talk about the the slides and stuff later. Yeah. Okay. Um, what are the three pillars you're most interested in currently? How would you incorporate one or two of each pillars on a home scale? So uh, I've done a lot with all three pillars. My over the years, I've in my work as a farm advisor and, and consultant, I've I've done an equal amount of research in all three areas. But I would say that um, you know I think that um, yeah, and I'm doing some research. A little bit in each area as well. So let's see. Now, uh, intent and in, let's see if I catch that one just a second. The intent in channeling energy, human attunement of the energy flow. Okay, so yes, intent is important. Um, yeah, prayer is important. Meditation can be important. You can do a lot of positive influence on your biofield, your natural energy field and your health by having positive thoughts with a real focus and intent. And I've actually taught uh, holistic gardening workshops on the weekend where I taught people how to meditate. <laughs> but that was in... That was in Austin, Texas, and outside of Portland, Seattle. Not not your average workshop. So, <clears throat> what is your favorite book and had the most profound on you and your life on the land? Wow, gosh, um, wow, just a whole library of stuff. The Acres USA Library is a really good one to to start with. And um, so, but I'm I'm still even this morning I was I was pulling down references that were published by William Albrecht from years ago. So that's a hard one to answer. Uh, if, you know, if you look online, you'll see that I've published a lot of stuff. So you can, you can get a lot of references. So um, I'm really skeptical about all this bioenergy stuff. Where to start with the easy stuff? Uh, okay, so the, the, if you, one of the things that I try to, um, on energy is just point to structured water devices like a scalar pendant um, or some other like a vortex magnet. Uh, I've got one downstairs actually where you vortex the water. It's got a vortex and magnets. And we, I do this with my wife. I've been in restaurants where we've done this with consultants and we do the before and after tests, taste test. So you can do this with wine. You can do this with juice, but you taste it first and then you treat it with your vortex device or your magnetic treatment device and then taste it again, you can tell the difference. Let me try to um, go down here, let's see. How do satellites and EMFs, et cetera, affect soil mineral uptake? Um, I do not know. This talk would be helpful to discriminate between the bogus claims and the solid ones. Yeah, what I can say is that when you are working with, yeah, there's a lot of products out there in eco-agriculture. There's humates, there's humic acids uh, in, in that area. There's in the energy field, if you look online, there's a lot of people that make claims right and left. I could kind of sniff through those claims pretty, pretty easily. It's like a bear walking through the woods, sniffing out where the food is. It's like when you come into, you're driving into a city that you're not familiar with, but you kind of, kind of, you're familiar with how cities are laid out. You kind of know where the McDonald's and Walmarts are, but then you also know where the good foods are. You know, you can kind of find your way around if you need to find a hardware store. So you kind of have to develop a nose for that in sniffing through the products and claims and things. It's called discernment. Uh, so let's see what else. Recommendations for a brand of Vortex and magnetic device. Yes, um, almost then you have follow-up. Um, 
list to put all that together, but there's um, there's a place called Quantum Balance in Colorado. They sell the Vortex and Magnetic device. There's also one called VE, VE uh, let's see, Vortex, Vortex Magnetic VME. I'm not sure, I'll have to find that device. It's in, um, it's in New Mexico. Let's see. Speaking of tasting differences, um, trying to elevate the importance of flavor. What devices are there that measure the flavor and nutrient correlations? Would that be BRICS or another measurement? BRICS is a very good measurement. It's very simple to use. You can get a refractometer and you can also get a digital refractometer. Um, I will say that all of these things are on a learning curve. Um, you know, it's one thing to get the soil test and put your minerals in there, but then you have to you have to try it this year, try it again next year, and you know it, it gets better. So I have helped farmers do this. Uh, so let's see what else you got there, Dan. People are starting to slow down, but uh, we're nearing the end of our hour and a half. Okay. So what any. In, Dan, you got any, anything else uh, that you want to uh, uh, share? Um, I'm just grateful that you were able to lay out such a broad-minded perspective on, you know, the EcoWag community. Um, I feel affirmed with everything you've 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 spoken, um, and this is the first pass on a. You know, broad strokes. So people have been asking about the energetics for the past, you know, 15 minutes. I'm not sure if that was just because that was the last third or because that's what people are most interested in. But um, yeah, it's a, it's an exciting conversation. So. So the, the way that we've got this scheduled is that, so this was the overview. So uh, the next time I forget, I don't know the date of the next one. Is it a month out or something like that? We're going to do a whole session on mineralization. So we'll go into more detail. We'll have some examples from soil tests and some uh, a, of, of, of what a soil test looks like and then what some practical applications are. And then also some options for um, a lower cost and higher cost to do all that. And um, so that will be a whole lecture. The same thing on biology, we'll go into much more detail on soil biology and the soil food web and humus management. And then the same thing, the last one will be um, more detail on bioenergetics. And so, yeah, we'll come back to all this. Great. Do you want to answer any more questions you see in the chat between now and 4.30 or? Uh, sure, let's see, uh, chat, uh, let's see. All right, so let's see what else. Uh, would you say EcoAg is fairly synonymous with regenerative ag? <laughs> uh, which is the most comprehensive term for people to use to understand and, and heal the ecosystem? So yeah, let me point that out is that Eco-agriculture, as I pointed out from the beginning, is closely, closely tied to Acres USA and this series of pioneers and consultants. So it's, it's much more around what I consider to be the cutting edge or sophisticated organic production because it does the monitoring and the modification based on the terrain assessment, the biological terrain assessment. And um, it's, it, you know, even some of the pioneers would say, why guess when you can measure? And so um, there's a, a little bit more of a scientific angle there, and that's why I call it sophisticated organics. Uh, I'd say regenerative ag is the new, new, the new kid on the block, and it's making really big waves in soil health. And it's, uh, it's remarkable what some of the regenerative ag farmers are doing, uh, combining no-till with grazing, multi-species, cover crops, multi-species, livestock. Uh, there's no doubt about that, um, but um, the younger crowd that's into regenerative ag doesn't, I don't think, even understands um, the history of eco-ag, and there's a real uh, uh, dispersion or aspersion to, to soil minerals, and um, people are confused. They've, they've heard people talk about soil biology. You shouldn't add any minerals to the soil. You can get all the minerals you need from any soil anywhere you want in the world with the right kind of soil biology. 
And most farmers, practicing farmers, just yawn at that at that comment. Um, you know, you're doing really productive farming, whether it's fruits and vegetables or or cropland stuff, or you're really pulling a lot of produce off there, a lot of biomass, a lot of minerals with it. Uh, you're on a schedule to uh, meet, um, you know, you got to harvest and you got to deliver to a CSA or to, to a market on a schedule. So there's, you know, you can't really have a delay. So, you know, that's why people have a balance of this, you know, both humus management, which is feeding the soil biology, and also some products and minerals to, to promote this, you know, the nutrient dense crops the nutritious crops, as well as meeting the harvest schedule, stuff like that. So, yeah, I, I like uh, region ag, regenerative ag, and there's a lot going on there, but I think people have uh, missed out on why these pioneers came up with this in the first place, that it hasn't gone away. It's the way soil works. Okay, so Christine Jones, she's big on, on soil carbon uh, being different than soil organic matter. Well, that's exactly what I was just talking about earlier was that there's a difference between soil organic matter and humus. And um, let's see, all, let's see, you know, there, there's a term, <laughs> anyways, the, there's a way of understanding that, but it's, um, yeah. And uh, we're at the end of our hour and a half, Steve. Pardon me? We're at the end of our hour and a half. Okay, it's all good then. All right, Dan, and everybody. Good to be with you and uh, look forward to the next time we get together. Yeah. Thank you very much, Steve. It's been a wonderful overview of the history of the movement over the last 50 years. Great. All right. Adios. Okay. <laughs>